so the optics was published late in Newton's career. There had been previous attempts, uh, notably in the 1670s and then again in the early to mid 1690s, to put together a treatise which would summarise and present the whole gamut of Newton's optical work, his theory of light and colour and other phenomena too. Um, it wasn't until 1704, the year after he became president of the Royal Society and after the death of Robert Hooke, that he published this work and it was incomplete when it was published. Um, it breaks off um, part way through and what's left to the reader is a series of queries which are typically posed as questions the answer to which is almost always yes. So that these are offered as conjectural and therefore not in need of dogmatic defence, yet they set forth a vast range of doctrinal and experimental results, observations, matters of fact and data relating to um, almost all aspects of the theory of matter. And they underwrite in fundamental ways both the optical and chromatic experiments presented in the earlier part of the book, The Optics, but they also clearly relate to um, the theory of matter and life that must be in play if the cosmology of the Principia is to make any sense at all. Initially, in the 1704 edition, the queries present uh, a series of remarks mainly about the capacity of particles to act at a distance between their centres immediately um, using very strong short-range attractive and repulsive forces so that the basic claims of Principia that there is a universal attractive force whose strength varies as one over the square of the distance between the centres of all particles of matter can now be enriched to include a range of such forces which are going to be used to explain the widest possible range of chemical and optical phenomena. Reflection, reflect, refraction, fermentation, cohesion, notably. So what this would have meant was to bring the realm of chemistry, above all, under the control of the kind of approach that Newton had set forth in the uh, Principia itself. Um, and then in successive revisions in 1706 and 1707 and then in 1717 the list of queries is extended and they become a series of almost internal debates inside the Newtonian project about puzzles and problems and now I think increasingly theological and philosophical and metaphysical questions that that initial set of claims raises. So three sets of problems are raised in the later queries. One, um, the cause of these forces. If matter can act where it is not, how can it do so without some kind of mediation? In the case of gravity, as Newton says in the 1690s in private to his disciples, God is very likely, if not certainly, the cause, since there cannot be a material cause of gravity because all matter gravitates. Is that true for uh, short-range attractive and repulsive forces? Perhaps not. Newton begins in complicated ways, first of all in a series of manuscripts in the 1690s and then more and more publicly and then in the queries of 1706 and 1717 to spell out the possibility of some kind of fluid, an ether, whose dynamical behaviour would underwrite the existence of these short-range attractive and repulsive forces. This ether or fluid 
is not itself purely mechanical, at least not purely mechanical by the standards of Descartes or Robert Hooke. It itself holds within it forces of attraction and repulsion which then appear to our own experience as, um, uh, as it were, macroscopic uh, phenomena of fermentation, optics, colour, light, cohesion and so on. Second set of problems that's raised are problems of uh, essentially a theological kind uh, to do with the evidence in the world for the existence of a wise, benevolent, but above all omnipotent creator. Um, much is made of the strong analogy between our relationship with our own bodies and God's relationship with nature so that it begins to be claimed in public that um, our minds are to our bodies as God is to the world. Um, it's as if uh, we have ideas in our mind the way God creates and sustains matter. That as it were, matter is simply, simply is maybe not the right word here, Matter is simply a part of space which God informs with the qualities of resistance and movement and so on. Uh, so a highly voluntarist ontology, but also one based on the analogy with the behaviour of our own will, our own soul and our own sensorium. That's very important for Newton's optical project right from the 1660s onwards. And then finally, what you also see in the queries are increasingly detailed and increasingly compelling experimental reflection on a range of spirits, um, electrical, effluvial, chemical, um, which are of the same order as the dynamical ether, which underwrites the forces of attraction and repulsion, but which become the topic of a new kind of natural philosophy. So that it's in these queries that Newton most explicitly in print spells out the claim that what he calls the business of experimental natural philosophy is to show the phenomena of active principles at work. And this is an essentially theological activity because what it does is to show that in even the most apparently passive and inert kinds of matter, divine will is at work. So the kind of theatrical performance of experiments with acids, with uh, the phenomena of light and fire, with the kind of electrical phenomena that his new experimental lieutenant Francis Hawksby is showing at the Royal Society, all those become a charter for the business of experimental philosophy as the display of highly dramatic active principles of fire and light and fermentation and explosion to an audience as part of a theological apologetic program. So a massively ambitious cosmology posed in conjectural subjunctive terms but which, as most readers understood it, were going to be part of orthodox Newtonian doctrine and for some 18th century readers the most important part of Newtonian doctrine. So some commentators wrote from the 1730s onwards that it was in the queries to the optics that you would find the essence of Newtonian natural philosophy.